Yes, I'm very pleased to I'm very pleased to introduce Phyllis Garip, uh, who is extremely impressive, as you just saw from the uh, video. Uh, back in uh, 2019, March of 2019, I started working with my colleagues uh, on the uh, board uh, for the Rahmi Koch Medal of Science uh, in that year to be given in the area of administrative and social sciences, humanities, and law. This would have been at that point and is our fourth uh, uh, scientist who would receive the Rahmi Koch Medal of uh, Science. And we started uh, with a list of 35 uh, scientists, uh, scientists in order to make sure we don't miss anyone. Uh, and then started paring it down in a process of several meetings, email meetings and, and Zoom meetings. We were using Zoom even at the time back in 2019. And, uh, and eventually uh, Phyllis was uh, by far the uh, winner and, uh, and was incredibly fitting uh, to the uh, requirements and the criteria that we used uh, for this uh, Rahmi Koch Medal of Science. This is a very special medal that Koch University has established uh, in the name of uh, Rahmi Koch, who has presided as the chairman of the board of trustees of Koch University for 23 years. And I'm very pleased uh, to uh, see that Phyllis Garib is uh, our, not only our fourth recipient of this medal, but she is the first woman recipient of this medal. She is an outstanding scientist with a story starting at Boazici, going to Princeton, going to Harvard, from there going to, after she became a professor at Harvard, to Cornell. And I'm very pleased to hear that she is now moving on in the process of moving back to Princeton. So uh, I'm pleased to introduce Fris Garib. We are very proud of her in every, every way. Go ahead, Fris. Okay, thank you. So it's, uh, you can share your screen, the floor, the online floor is yours. Thank you so much. Let me take a second to share the screen. And it's a very humbling experience to receive this very kind and generous introduction, to receive this award, to watch the video and to watch all your colleagues, former advisors speaking about you. I just, uh, you know, I'm working hard to keep the emotions down. So it's a, it's a big, big honor for me to receive this award. And I'm hoping the impact will be long-term. I see myself as a member of Koch University family now. And I wanna thank each one of you for inviting me to become part of this uh, important community. And I look forward to meeting each one of you in person when the conditions allow it. So today I wanted to talk about some of the newer projects that I'm working on as part of a team. And uh, at Cornell, um, this work has been supported by the Atkinson Center and a grant from the Migrations Grant Challenge. So Cornell University declared migration as one of the great challenges facing humanity now. And they've been supporting um, this work. And here I collaborate with an economist, Nancy Chow, on this project, and also an ornithologist, Amanda Rodewald, who studies bird migration. So this is her first foray into human migration. And we have two brilliant students, Mario Molina and Julia Zhu, a sociologist and an economist, uh, on the project as well. So I, I'll just um, give an overview. So the first part of the project is joint with Mario and the second part is joint with Julia and also Nancy and Amanda. So in, in these linked um, papers, we're trying to understand how migration, human migration can be linked to environmental changes. And this is becoming an increasingly important question in the context of climate change. Uh, in the near future, we expect extreme weather events to increase both in frequency and severity, things like droughts, floods, hurricanes, and we expect 
more human displacement as a result of this. And there's growing body of research on this question. And this research focuses mainly on weather fluctuations, things like changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, rainfall. There's also a body of work that looks at how sudden onset events like a hurricane displaces people. But in this um, part of the research, we're just focusing on gradual changes that build up over time. And we're already accumulating some findings on this, how changes in temperature, these gradual shifts in temperature, gradual declines in rainfall are affecting human mobility. So if we go back to the early 2000s, Kaiwan Munshi, an economist, was the first to write about the impact of rainfall on migration between Mexico and the United States. So his work showed that lower rainfall led to more migration and the, me the mechanism he had in mind was lower agricultural yield. So if it doesn't rain enough, you can't get enough production. If you can't get enough production, you have to send a migrant. And later work tested this mechanism, this agricultural yields. So Fang and colleagues study showed that low rainfall indeed leads to lower agricultural yields and more US migration. So this finding seems intuitive and consistent, but then there are a lot of mixed results that came after that. For example, Rios Mana and colleagues studied the same thing. They looked at rainfall and migration patterns, and they found an effect of low rainfall on migration, but only in well-off communities. So uh, their argument went that in these communities, people can finance migration, which can be costly to cross the border, especially if you're using a smuggler. And only in well-off communities, you can see this weather response. But then when they looked at temperature, they observed the opposite pattern. It was only the poor communities who were sending migrants when the heat was excessive. So this is only one example, but points to a larger point. We are accumulating a lot of findings, but most of the time these findings are conflicting. And uh, one of the reasons for, um, if, for this state of affairs is it's hard to know how weather will impact migration flows. We haven't yet developed theories around the impact of the environment on human mobility. And there's also a lot of technical issues that we need to resolve. So the first issue is communities, places have different normals. For example, really hot weather in Antalya might not be unusual, but really hot weather in Zonguldak might really change things for people living there. And somehow you need to correct for these place specific normal. And studies do this differently. So some studies take a 30 year period, so let's say 1960 to 1990 as the normal period. And some studies say we need to look at only the last decade and that changes results. Second, weather fluctuations might create an effect, but a delayed one. So you need to look at not just this year's weather, but last year's, maybe two years ago. But how many lags do you include? And based on what frequency? Do you use years? Do you use months? Do you use days? So this is also an unknown. Third, weather fluctuations can create a cumulative response. Um, so for example, if there's a year of drought, that might create little impact in a community, let's say if there's an irrigation system. But if irrigation water runs out, in a few years, you might suddenly start seeing this impact. So this kind of cumulative response is typically called intensification. And not every study corrects for that. Or we might observe the opposite pattern. You might observe a decaying response. So once the weather conditions start going badly for the community, communities might adapt and that's how you will not see much of an effect in, um, in the uh, future years. And this is known as adaptation. So basically there are many different possibilities here and it makes it difficult for us to model the relationship between weather and migration. Firstly, because there, there might be complex interactions between weather now and past weather. For example, I mentioned intensification Intensification. intensification means that the impact of this year's weather depends on what happened last year, the year before, and so on. And second, on a different level, we might also um, foresee interactions between weather and other characteristics of families and communities, how vulnerable the communities are, how many resources they have, how many alternative um, livelihood strategies they have. So basically the big question we want to ask in this project is how can we consider all these complex interactions and come up with robust results that won't change from sample to sample, from different measure to measure. Now, if we consider many, many interactions, let's say we have 50 different 
variables to measure weather. And we're measuring many, many lags. And we want to consider all kinds of interactions between them. So that, that quickly creates a very complex model. If you have 50 uh, variables, if you want to consider all the possible interactions among them, you have two to the power of 50 parameters, more parameters than observations. And even if you say, I'm not going to do such a complex model, I'll select a few things and consider interactions between them. With a sufficiently complex model, you might overfit the data at hand, which means you're capturing the idiosyncrasies of the data, not just the signal, but also the noise. And your model, your perfect model, does not generalize to new data. So how do we solve these issues? So basically, to address these potential problems, and to understand how migration responds to weather changes. Here, we started out by using machine learning tools. So these tools are designed to fit very complex models without overfitting the data, without capturing the noise and focusing only on the signal. So machine learning is a field, growing field at the intersection of statistics and computer science. And its goal is simple. It seeks to automate discovery from data. So in the past, intelligence systems um, used fixed algorithms that coded all outputs for all possible inputs. And nowadays, intelligence systems uh, basically fit complex uh, functions in order to learn from data, in order to automate the discovery from data. So um, with Mario Molina, the student working on this project, we wrote a review article on this topic for the applications of machine learning in, in sociology. And there we talk about two general classes. And not everybody agrees that this is the right way to divide them, but you know, uh, let's take it uh, th that for granted now. So one class is the so-called unsupervised machine learning tools. And here you're trying to discover representations of some input X. And this is the methodology I used um, in my book where I was trying to classify different migrants into different groups. Now, another class of tools are called supervised machine learning tools or SML. And here your goal is to link an input X to an output Y in order to make predictions on new data. So, and this is a big difference between the traditional classical estimation tools we use in the social sciences. So, which are all a version of ordinarily squares. And here we favor simple models. We come up with a simple model that might have generated the data. And then we estimate the parameters of that um, model from data. And then we interpret these parameters. So we basically write an equation that links X to Y and the parameters beta represent the relationship between them. So we're trying to estimate those and interpret how X, something like weather impacts migration. Now, the downside of this is we ignore model uncertainty. There might be many alternative models um, that equally fit the data, but we're not always considering those possibilities. And we don't really focus on out of sample performance. We only test if our model fits the data at hand. The upside of these uh, tools is that the models are quite simple and parametric, this means that we're not overfitting the data. But at the same time, we're imposing this linear vision of the world and we're not considering complex interactions and nonlinearities. So the supervised machine learning tools are designed exactly for that, where you consider complex non-parametric, sometimes non-parametric models, and your aim is predictive accuracy, not coming up with parameters that describe the relationship. So the downside here is that you might end up with black box results. In other words, you might come up with a model that really predicts well the um, output, but you don't know why it's predicting that, that well. So in a way you might have, you might gain no insight into the mechanisms linking X to Y. So basically we're using these latter tools, the supervised machine learning tools to answer a simple question. Can we predict migration at the individual level? Can we tell who the migrants will be from our data? And then can we predict it better if we consider weather as an input? Now, the method we use is based on the so-called regression trees. So it's, it's, you can imagine a tree-like model that describes a sequence of splits in the input space X. And at the end of each of the branches, you have a prediction Y at the end node. So this is a very good strategy for capturing nonlinearities and interactions in X. So I'll give a very simple example. Let's say we want to predict if someone is a migrant or not, a zero-one outcome, and we have two inputs, age and education. 
So we can imagine a tree, a regression tree, splitting first by age. So we split our sample into young and old. And then for each branch, we have further splits by education, college educated and non-educated. So at the end of each node or leaf, we have a prediction. So here we see that young and college educated people are migrants, everyone else is a non-migrant. So you can see that with enough splits in a tree, if you go deeper and deeper, you can perfectly predict everyone. But then that's not always your goal because you might be capturing the idiosyncrasies in the data as well. So the balance here is coming up with constraints on this model so that you can predict well, not only in your sample, but also outside your sample as well. So the method we use is a version of this. We're estimating not just one tree, but thousands of different trees. This gives the name um, random forests to the strategy. Uh, so you're creating not trees, but forests. And this gives you more accurate predictions because you're averaging over many possible trees, but then the relationship of X to Y becomes less interpretable. So you're creating a bit of a black box here. The setting we're studying is Mexico US migration here. So, um, you know, so this is a setting um, that has given us the longest sustained and the biggest international migration flow in the world. And it's also a setting where a large data set exists. So the data I study comes from the Mexican Migration Project. So this project started in the 1980s. And after that, every year, researchers went to Mexico, identified three or four communities, and first of all, canvassed the entire community. So they produced a map of the community with every house on the community numbered, and then they randomly selected 200 households and they collected information on everyone in that household, including migrants who might be absent, who might be in the United States. So they collected also information, not only one point in time, but they collected life histories. So although everybody is interviewed only once, you can actually know about everything that person did up until that year. So this gives us information from about 140,000 individuals and 20,000 of them uh, roughly, have migrated to the US at least once. And we're using the data between 1980 and 2090. Now, we use uh, these communities, the information from the communities, but on them, we overlay fine-grained weather data. So the weather observations we have come from the NASA Earth Observing System. So this is the most detailed data that's available to date. It started in 1980. And we have daily weather information on every one kilometer square grid on Earth. Um, and what we do is we take the community boundaries and we overlay these one kilometer square grids on the community boundary and we average over the grids to compute daily weather measures for every community in our data. Now, one thing that we quickly learned was the importance of the scale of the data. A lot of the work in the literature relies on data from weather stations and at the state level. Uh, but states are really huge in, um, in Mexico. And one of the things we wanted to know was, does it really make a difference to look at it at the finer scale? So here on the map, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you precipitation in 2000 at the state level in Mexico. And I'm showing this in deviation form. So basically we're treating 1980 to 84 as the normal period. And we're looking at the difference in precipitation in each state to that baseline period. And we're dividing it by the standard deviation. So how many standard deviations has the community moved in terms of rainfall? So red means the community has received less than its normal time. And blue means it has received more than its normal time. So immediately we can see the effects of climate change in a period of 20 years, every state has received either equal or slightly less than it has in 1980s. And then on the right hand side, we're seeing the same figure produced at the municipality level. And you can see there's a lot more variation in the municipality level data. So if we take only one state here in the green rectangle, this is the state of Sonora. On the left-hand side, we see that there hasn't been much change between 2000 and 1984. But then on the right-hand side, if we look at it municipality level, we see all these microclimates. So some municipalities has, have received a lot more, other municipalities a lot less. So the communities we're studying are actually even smaller than the municipalities. So there's a lot more variation. And the results are really different if you use state, municipality, or community level 
uh, result uh, data. So the finer grain data really, really makes a difference. The same thing with temperature measurement. Okay, so the setting is Mexico US migration. The outcome is taking a first migration trip to the United States. So we have data on additional trips as well, but as people migrate, their characteristics change as a result of migration. So we wanna capture people before migration changes them. So we can identify the causal factors related to that move. And the inputs we consider are individual characteristics like their age, sex, education, measure, measures of their household wealth. And in some models, we include community level indicators as well, whether it's a rural community, the level of involvement in agriculture, migration history of that community. And then when it comes to weather measures, this is where our theories basically fall short. We don't know how weather should factor into people's decisions. And these methods that we used really thrive on having as many variables as you can. So here we basically looked at the literature and we picked up every measure people have used and came up with you know, tens of measures uh, and we basically include every measure in five-year lag. So um, in every year, you look at five years back. So you basically can consider this history as well. And we're being agnostic about which of these measures will be most important. We're hoping the data will tell us which ones are most predictive. Okay, so before I move on to the results, one thing is kind of worth mentioning here. In ordinarily squares, our goal is to of, you know, come up with a model that best fits the data at hand. So we use the same data to select the model and to evaluate its performance. In supervised machine learning, your goal is to predict out of sample on previously unseen data. So to achieve this outcome, to ensure that your model is predictive out of sample, you typically divide your sample into three parts. So the first part is the training data, which you use to fit different models. The second part is the validation data, where you're using this to select the best one among them, among the different models that you fit. And finally, there's a test data set that you don't touch, and we haven't touched yet, until the very end of the project. And this tells you the true performance of your final model. So basically, we have 140,000 individuals in the data. We assign 50% of them to the training data, and the remaining 50%, we divide half and half into validation and test data. So our test, test data is still in the vault. We haven't touched it. So the question, can we predict migration? If we're really naive about it, yes and too well, but this is because of the imbalance in the data. Now, I said we have person year observations. We observe for each person many, many years in the past. So we have about 2 million person years in our data and we only have 20,000 migration events. Remember, we're only looking at first migration. So this is less than 1% of the observations. So a model that always predicts no migration is accurate 99% of the time. So this tells us that with such unbalanced data, we can't look at average accuracy, but instead we need to look at accuracy of predictions among migrants and non-migrants. When we see that, uh, when we do that, we actually see our predictions are not really good. So in the training data, actually, it's respectable. So we see that among non-migrants, we can predict 100% of the time. Among migrants, we're 87% successful. But this is only in the training data. If we look at the validation data, so this is the data set that we didn't use in fitting the models, our predictions are just awful. So for non-migrants, we see we're predicting 99% of the time. For migrants, our success rate is only 6%. So this shows us that even by looking at a different data set than the model that we use to fit, um, um, you know, uh, we're actually learning a lot about how well we're doing. Now, um, to avoid this kind of overfitting the training data. So clearly we're capturing some noise in the training data that doesn't exist in the validation data. So what can we do about this? So we can restrict the tree depth, which means we can tell our model to be less complex. So it's not capturing every little bit in our training data so that it can generalize better. So we do that by restricting the tree depth to 30. And then we also 
um, assign different uh, prices to making mistakes for migrants and non-migrants. In other words, we can tell the model that it's much costlier to make a mistake on migration predictions than it is for non-migration predictions. When we do that, when we increase the cost to 1 million to 1, for example, we see that our predictions for non-migrants are slightly worse off, but our predictions for migrants have improved to 50%. If we keep increasing the cost, we can perfectly predict migrants, but this time we're not predicting non-migrants that well. So there's always a trade-off. So what happens if we uh, select the best model at hand? Can we predict migration and can we predict it better with weather? So here uh, we're seeing the so-called rock curve. So this, is, this stands for receiving operator characteristics. So it's basically showing us on the y-axis the true positive rate and on the x-axis the false positive rate. So if you had a perfect model, basically your model would jump up to one. So your total positive rate would be one and it would stay there. And then in order to evaluate different models, you can you know, plot the, this curve to false positive to true positive rate. And you can look at the area under the curve. So basically, if you're the perfect model, the area under the curve would be one, and anything that gets close to that is a good fit. So here we're seeing curves for different models. The red curve is when we include no weather data and we basically pick the best model uh, that we can. And then the other colored curves show different combinations of weather uh, characteristics. So basically, if we look at the area under the curve as a performance statistic, we see that with no weather, our area under the curve is 0.79. This means that our model is able to differentiate between migrants and non-migrants 79% of the time. If we include weather, basically we have a slight improvement, but not a whole lot. So we are, the area under the curve is now 81%. Basically, can we predict migration better with weather? Yes, but only slightly. Now, how does this complex model perform if we compare it to a much simpler model? What if we fit a logistic regression because we have a binary outcome zero one and we hand selected a few weather indicators. So the model is not overly complex. We're using this linear model. We see that the area under the curve is actually not that worse off. So remember our best model, the area under the curve was 81%. With a simple logistic regression, we can achieve 78%. So there is a gain, but not a whole lot. Now, what does this tell us? These findings are very similar to recent findings from the social sciences that applied machine learning tools. So here I'm showing a recent PNAS article that reported on a mass collaboration effort um, run by Matt Salganik, who's a Princeton sociologist. And I wrote a commentary on that effort. So the, the mass collaboration involved the fragile family survey data. So this is a social survey data that has been following the same families, about 4,000 of them um, since 2000. And the new wave of the data was just about to be released. So researchers use this opportunity to see if we can use existing data to predict future outcomes in things like whether kids drop out of school, their GPA. And they had different teams compete on this task. So 160 teams competed, not only social scientists, but also computer scientists teams. And they used all sorts of machine learning tools, not only in random forests. And what they learned was basically all models performed poorly in predicting life outcomes, regardless of the method that they used. They also found that these really complex models did not really improve much on a much simpler model with a few expert selected indicators, like a linear regression, basically. So basically, in my commentary, I reflected on this finding. And I think these reflections apply to my case as well, that why can't we predict individual outcomes with more accuracy? And we can think of a number of um, answers to this. One answer could be maybe the survey data that we have might be missing key aspects of people's lives. Maybe we're asking about their education, their wealth, but we're missing other things like health emergencies that might happen to them that are more predictive of um, their choices. Or we might say maybe life outcomes are too idiosyncratic and there's a predictability ceiling. So maybe as social scientists, we can say meaningful things about aggregate patterns, the relationship of, let's say, economic situation to migration, but this doesn't mean that we can predict the outcomes for each and every individuals. 
So these are all on the downside. But on the upside, what we've learned from these um, you know, collaboration efforts in our study as well, is that existing parametric models, especially when they're um, based on domain knowledge, can be quite, uh, can, can perform quite well, almost as well as these complex models. So basically in the second part of the talk, I'm focusing on that aspect and asking this question, can we use our expert knowledge or domain knowledge to specify and test particular weather migration relationships. In other words, the reason we started with machine learning was we don't know how weather might be related to migration. So let's put everything in there and let the, let's let the data select the best inputs. Now we're just, we learned that we, we actually are not gaining much from this effort. So now we're turning the question around and asking, what if we're really careful in specifying particular relationships using our expert knowledge? And where does that expert knowledge come from? Obviously from the literature, but also from our own observations during field work in Mexico. So in the summer of 2019, with a team uh, of researchers, we went to um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the Chiapas region, which is the southernmost area in Mexico where coffee production uh, is really prominent and coffee plants are really impacted by climate change. So we wanted to talk to the producers there and see what kind of uh, things mattered in their production. We also went to the Jalisco region, which is a, a historically migrant sanding area in Mexico and corn production is the main activity there. So we spoke to corn growers. And some of the things we learned were things we already knew, but some information was really illuminating and, um, and new. So first of all, a lot of people talked about how weather is a lot more unpredictable now. So here, a corn farmer in, in Jalisco is talking about, you know, they knew when the rain would come and they knew how big the lake would get so they could plan around that 10 years ago. But nowadays, it's all very unpredictable. And the same pattern in Chiapas, this coffee farmer is talking about them knowing when the summer would come uh, to prune the coffee plants, but nowadays it's all a guessing game. And one thing that we learned that was quite interesting was how weather comes in different, how you know, having a bad harvest in one year means that, that you, need to, uh, you need to basically carry on to the next year. So the impact of weather changes might have this long arm. We need to consider that. And a lot of the people we talked to recognize migration as an alternative. They directly connected more migration to people not making enough money from their farming activities, but they also recognize that migration is really costly. So they need to save money to pay a smuggler to cover the costs of travel. And debt from a poor harvest can actually stall migration from being an alternative. So how, do, how can we incorporate these insights into our analysis now that we've learned you know, what to expect. So here, uh, we're kind of trying to design a parametric uh, model. So we're trying to connect the first trip, uh, first US trip at time T to precipitation and temperature in the past year. We also consider precipitation and temperature two years ago, but we don't include more lags because we're gonna include many interactions between them and we don't want our model to get overly complex. We include individual level and household level indicators in X, and to account for temporal changes that might affect each state differently, we include state times year binary indicators here. So fixed effects for that. Now, then we add many, many layers onto this baseline model to incorporate the insights that we learned. First of all, we include interactions to understand how different combinations of precipitation and temperature matter. So basically we're asking, is low rainfall more detrimental when there's excessive heat as well at the same time? Or do we see independent effects of temperature and precipitation? Second, and this is really important, we consider the full spectrum of weather events. So in the literature, most studies focus on negative weather events things that will hurt your production, like excessive heat or low rainfall. But what we learned from the farmers tells us that actually good weather can allow people to save for future migration trips. So we need to account for that. So we consider the full spectrum. We compare each community to its own normal. And we define this normal as the period between 1980 and 1990. And this allows us to take into account adaptation. So if a 
the community's baseline is already too hot or you know, low rain, we don't expect much of a response from that community. And then we introduce interactions between temporal lags, what happened this year versus last year. This allows us to see how sequences of events matter and if intensification of, um, uh, of impacts is important. So basically, if we have two years of bad weather in a row, is the impact different? Is if good weather follows bad weather, what happens? So on and so forth. And then we test for heterogeneity by household wealth status. So remember, people talked about how it was costly to migrate. So maybe we figure rich households are able to respond quicker than poor households because they can finance the migration move. Okay. So the data decisions, um, we still use the Mexican Migration Project, but we focus only on rural communities. So we leave aside the urban uh, communities because the mechanism we have in mind is agricultural yields. And then this gives us information of, on about 56,000 household uh, individuals in 13,000 um, households. And we focus on the migration trips between 1991 and 2018. The normal period is 80 to 90. So basically, all weather indicators are computed as deviations from the mean in the normal period, divided by the standard deviation. So basically, both for temperature and precipitation, we have five different measures. So very wet and very hot means it's two standard deviations or more out from the normal. And you have all the other possibilities as well. Okay, what do we find? I'm almost done. So basically, what this farmer said that you know, now when it rains, it's also hot. That really seemed to be very, very important. Combinations of rain and heat matter. In other words, low rainfall by itself does not create a migration response, but low rainfall combined with excessive heat is when we see the migration response. Second, we see both good and bad weather mattering in the migration decision. Third, we see um, heterogeneity in migration responses by household wealth. Basically, we see that rich households migrate when last year's weather is bad. So here I'm showing some coefficients uh, from our model. We see that when it's very dry and hot last year, we have a positive response from wealthy households. And similarly, when it's dry and very hot, again, in negative conditions for agricultural production, we see a positive response, but only from wealthy households. The poor cannot respond or do not respond. Poor households, on the other hand, migrate when last year's weather is actually good. So when it's wet and very cool, so that's advantageous weather, we see poor households migrating at a higher rate. So this tells us that poor households actually need to save money, and that's why good weather allows them to migrate. And we see this effect even more when we consider sequences of events. So we see that poor households actually migrate when two years ago, the weather is bad, followed by good weather last year. So basically you experience adversity, but then you need to save. And then that needs to be followed by favorable weather conditions. And only in that combination, you can migrate. For rich households, this doesn't apply. Rich households can immediately resort to migration. Okay, what does this tell us? Uh, the main takeaways from this project so far. So we see that migration is actually an adaptation strategy to weather, but it's only one that's available to rich households. They can respond to it much faster than the poor. And this tells us that you know, inequality uh, will really matter in who can survive the calamities that we might experience from climate change, we can expect rich households to resort to adaptation strategies, but poor households will largely be left behind. And uh, from you know, an analytical perspective, we learned that considering combination and sequencing of weather events, and also their full spectrum, both good and bad weather conditions, is crucial to understanding weather migration link. So if we consider two parts of the project, I think they complement each other. We see in the second project that well-specified Parametric models offer us insight into mechanisms. So we see what conditions create what kind of response for which uh, types of households. But the non-parametric models that we began with in the, in, uh, in the first part of the talk, they offer us useful information about overall predictive capacity. And they tell us that they, we always need to evaluate our models on a sample that we didn't use in the predictions. Um, so, in the future, we've obtained administrative data from the Mexican government on agricultural yields at the municipality level. So we're planning 
to carefully model the mechanisms um, through which weather might impact migration. We've also collected disaster data. So we're looking into how sudden onset events create a migration response. So thank you so much for listening and I would be happy to receive any questions or comments on this. Uh, there was one question in the chat. So if you can take a look at that. Sure. So I think if it's the same question I'm seeing, so uh, Faryal Punar asks, um, so about a personal history, graduated from industrial engineering, but why PhD in sociology? So, you know, I still don't know initially kind of what led to it. I think it was just an intense interest in whatever I was reading in sociology. I, as I said in the video, I accidentally stumbled upon a course that fit my schedule in sociology. And I took that class at Princeton and I was mesmerized with whatever I was reading. And I took that gut feeling as something that I should keep doing. And once I got into the sociology program, my family reacted, but then we bargained and we said, okay, I'll just try this for a year. So it was little steps at first, but after a year, I was sure that this was something uh, that I wanted to do. And, you know, as you might know, in the Turkish system, uh, we're put on tracks. If you're good at math in high school, you're immediately on the engineering and medicine track. So I also feel like I didn't consider social sciences because of that uh, earlier. But thank you for the question. I don't know, any more questions? We still have quite a few people, but. Okay. Well, let me say this, if anyone comes up with a question later on, both on the personal front, career front, research front, I'm happy to answer them uh, via email. So, um, yeah. There are a few questions now. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's a good question. So do you create hidden neural, neural nodes by doing field trips and trying to understand the variables? Yes, I think, I think the machine learning tools actually, I increasingly think that we tend to think whatever we dump on them, the model will be able to select among the variables. But uh, I think the more I think about it, the more well-informed our variable selection is, the more domain knowledge we can bring into um, what we're feeding the model. Uh, I think the better our predictions will also become. So I don't, I no longer see this as an either or, you either think very carefully about and come up with a parametric model or you basically take everything and dump it into, um, you know, some sort of machine learning algorithm. I think you can, both methods can learn from one another. So the lesson that I've learned is that the more, the better indicators we fed into the machine learning algorithm, the better it worked. And similarly, we brought the machine learning uh, thinking into our OLS, and we still kind of set aside part of our data to test, you know, how our you know parametric model fits the data in the data that we set aside, and then in the data that it hadn't seen before. So I think uh, I see these tools as complementary. And then uh, Ray Wigan asks regarding rich and poor, what about economic? Um, changes um, in the economy. So that's a very good question because in Mexico, like in many developing countries, um, over the years, you see you know, GDP improving um, and you know, communities becoming, you know, uh, or you know, households becoming richer. So if you look at the households in the 1960s, very few of them own houses, but by the time you come to 2000s, actually more and more people have accumulated uh, wealth. Um, so there are a couple of ways of dealing with this. So the data actually allow us to know when the purchases were made so that we can take out the purchases that were financed by migration. So basically for each individual, we're looking at first migration, but somebody in the family might have migrated before so that their wealth is a result of this past migration. So we try to rule that out. And then secondly, we also measure wealth in different ways. So one way we measure it is in absolute terms. And in absolute terms, everybody's wealth is increasing over time, but we also measure it in relative terms. So relative to others in the community, 
whether you're well off or not. And in both cases, we see this kind of wealth impact, but that's, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I have a question, Andana. So, Pilisanam, can you, these are marvelous uh, techniques, marvelous studies, massive data that you are analyzing and it's very impressive. Can you apply these techniques to the Syrian migration, uh, which is a sudden event on the scale of the things you're studying. It's a sudden influx, which then changes character or the migration in Eastern Turkey uh, with the Iraq border and such. Yes, so I, you know, I think there's one of the good things is that, uh, you know, in the US, many of the undocumented migrants are not recorded in any way. So these surveys that we do in Mexico are a way of capturing them because once they come to the US, you won't find them in the census, you won't find them in other you know, data collection efforts because basically they're hiding um, from such reporting. But in Turkey with Syrian migrants and Iraqi migrants, vast majority of them are being recorded by the Turkish government because they receive these documents that allow them to get healthcare and, you know, register their kids. So basically there is a massive data set yeah. somewhere, uh, you know, uh, the, in these administrative records. And, you know, I think we can create a lot of measures ourselves as well by looking at when they migrated, where did they come from, which routes they used, and then collect a lot of historical data on these regions. Because, you know, people also argue that war was the last straw that pushed people, but then people were already strained by droughts. The economy was already collapsing. So there is a past to this. And we could see if there are certain regions that produce more of a response to war that because of economic strain. So I think it's uh, definitely doable, um, given that there's access uh, to these data sources. Good. There are other questions. Yes, I see many questions. So I'll, I'll start with Tutku Kulichaslan's question. What is the disadvantages of working interdisciplinarily? Have you overall with knowledge to gain from different fields? Can you share what you face through, uh, through your path? So, um, so I think, first of all, when I first switched to sociology, I think it was really hard to learn a completely new way of thinking and to understand what I was reading and to gain this um, larger insight into how to, um, how to evaluate and see the work there. I think, first of all, humility is the number one um, ingredient here. You need to be humble and give it some time to, for you to learn. And, um, and then when I started writing and I, when I started using these different tools, I think there was also challenges into the reception of these methods. Because whenever you're using a new tool, um, you're making an already skeptical reader even more skeptical. And uh, so the work I was writing got rejected many, many times before I learned how to communicate these methods, before I fully understood where people's objections were coming from, where they were skept where their skepticism was coming from. So I think it's, it's you know, like many things you learn through these failures, um, but I see great potential uh, in doing this work, it's not just me, but I think in, in the social sciences and the sciences in general, nowadays we see less and less rigid boundaries between disciplines. You can't write about a topic by only reading your own discipline. And, uh, and especially when you're studying something uh, you know, like migration where economists, demographers, geographers are all writing about it. And we're all trying to say, you know, solve the same questions. So I think we need to learn from each other, learn to understand each other. Maybe I can't do the sophisticated modeling that some economists are doing, but I'm still very, very open to um, learning from them. But it is challenging, but it's also the future, I think. So uh, Kemal Kirishchi asks, uh, fascinating presentation, okay, first question. Yes, so degree in industrial engineering helps with your research, absolutely. It didn't help in the beginning because I was such a novice in sociology and I just, I think the first five years in the PhD program, I was completely immersing myself in this new way of thinking, reading and understanding social sciences in general. Um, and 
economics as a discipline really helped because it was kind of in between engineering and sociology where you had formal modeling, but also social science questions. So I took classes from economics as well. Um, but I think eventually when I started out my career, I just started seeing that I could read also in computer science, I could read also kind of the machine learning literature and understand it and maybe have this translation role of taking these methods and um, you know, talking about them in a way that social scientists would be receptive to and writing the review article and maybe teaching courses on this is really um, how I'm trying to kind of further that goal because I think it helps everyone to be aware of these different tools. Um, and Begum Argun asks, about a different uh, work. Yes, so uh, basically it's a question about taking these findings, taking academic research and thinking about policy and how we can bridge the gap between what academics are doing and what how policymakers are uh, making decisions. I think this is just a, a very big question that I'm trying to kind of answer for myself and also find role models. Even in the US, where you would think there would be more of, of a bridge between you know, policymaking and um, you know, academia, it's not so easy to establish these linkages. It's not obvious. So one way that I started this process is by writing op-eds uh, to uh, newspapers and basically trying to reach a broader audience. I don't think that that has a direct impact on policymaking, but I'm still kind of trying to work out that path of what's the best way. One thing that I'm doing now is working on a trade book that would be more broad audience, not an academic book, but something that would be sold in regular bookstores to write about migration. And yes, I think that's really important to, uh, to take this knowledge that we're creating and making it useful on more recent periods, especially after 2000s. And, um, and uh, because this is when we're starting to feel the effect of climate change. So I think that's really, really important. So to be honest, when I started the Mexican project, although we had many, many years of data, I didn't think we would see much of a weather impact. And so I'm personally surprised by the robustness of the weather impact, even when you take into account other things. Um, weather still makes a difference who, who migrates. And I agree that the effect will only be stronger from this, uh, this point on. Maybe Mexico is not the best setting to study this because there are other regions of the world like um, Africa, Bangladesh, you know, countries that are experiencing this change you know, more quickly. Maybe that's the way to study this. But to see this in a setting like Mexico where climate change is not as dramatic as in other settings, and to see the impact of even small changes in precipitation tells us that you know, climate change will have a major impact um, on mobility. So, sorry, I feel like I'm having a very long monologue, but I'll read the question. So, Umushnur Özjan asks, um, did you take the wealth variable as a categorical or ordinal variable? So can we draw conclusions on migration of families according to the level of their income based on a range between poor and rich. So we didn't use income here because income was not a very clean measure here. They asked about it in different ways over time. At first they, was, they were asking about wages of um, household head, but then they quickly realized that many people did not make wages. So that they were confused by the question. So at some point in the data collection, they converted it to the, to the total income of household. But still, it was not. It was only measured at one point in time. So we used instead the properties that household has. If a household has a business and the value of land that they own, and we tried with the land measure, we tried both a cate categorical measure but also a continuous measure, and uh, the results were similar. With the properties measure, in order to make it more informative, we looked at the number of rooms in a property they owned to kind of. Uh, gauge the value of the property. And again, we tried, you know, counts also kind of categories and the results are um, quite similar. So Ahmed Ichzuigu, thank you so much for your comments. And I really respect the, the Migration Center at Koch University and I can't wait to uh, talk more and work more uh, together. Ahmed Ichzuigu asks, um, let me explain, cover the undocumented movements. So do the data cover the undocumented movements? 
about, is it possible to draw some conclusions about dynamics of smuggling business? Does the project pay attention to weather changes in the destination places? Yes. Can we predict, can we develop another model in which also considers the impact of weather? Amazing questions. So um, yes, so about 85% of the migrants here are undocumented crossers. For a portion of them, for the household heads and their spouses, we have information on how they crossed and how much they paid smugglers and which entry point they used. So on a different project with Nancy Chow, who's an economist, we're modeling how uh, migration policies on the US border shifts, you know, which routes migrants use, uh, basically. And we're using smuggling fees also as a measure there. And the riskier places have lower smuggling fees in general. So if you're willing to take a risk, and then you pay less, if you want risk-free crossing, then you pay smugglers more, and that changes with US migration policies. I think the point about thinking about climate change, not only in sending places, but receiving places is really crucial, and it's not something that people have done much. And so we're trying to um, model that right now. The thing is we know really well which state they crossed to, so if they went to California, but in terms of the cities they're in, the information is sparser. Um, but I would expect that places like California that are experiencing drought, maybe people are shifting away from that because of climate change and because there's less of a need of agricultural workers, but that's definitely a direction that we want to go in. So um, Anul Shan asks, from the Balkans to Turkey, it was lots of migration waves last century. Do you plan to do research on the subject in the following years? So my parents would be delighted if I started studying the Balkans. They've been pushing me in this direction because we're immigrants from that region. And um, there are historians working on this, but in, in terms of the kinds of work that I do that require either talking to migrants as they're thinking about the decision or using large data sets, I don't know that there's a possibility there, but I would love to if there's an opportunity. So Ray Wigan asks another economic question. Okay, so there was a common pattern of seasonal migration where Mexicans would travel across the border to help Southern state farmers with the harvests. Officials turned a blind eye to the illegal migration due to pressures from farmers who couldn't get local labor. The Mexican seasonal workers would receive good income by Mexican standards. That's absolutely true. So the, um, for, a, for a long time, and maybe still, the US government's policy is to look the other way when it comes to undocumented migration. And, um, and building a wall is basically a great uh, indication of this because everybody knows the wall doesn't work, but also it's a big symbol. It gives the impression that you're doing something about immigration. So that's why it's been a preferred policy for many, many years. So the agricultural production is absolutely dependent in certain states on immigrant labor. And yes, that's why we see such high undocumented migration rates because on some level, the US government knows this dependency and allows undocumented migration to continue. And um, on a related point, in the 1940s and 1950s, there was an official guest worker program, like the one for Turks in Germany, where Migrants would come with documents and they would receive insurance benefits, they would receive wages, they would receive accommodations. In the 1960s, this program was abandoned and in a way it became more profitable for farmers to hire undocumented migrants because they no longer had to pay benefits, they no longer had to provide accommodations. So in a way, economically, undocumented migration serves uh, the farmers um, better, but with uh, with a situation like this, like a pandemic where crossing becomes impossible, then, you know, maybe documented migration is the better way to uh, ensure workers, but great question. So the final question, Tutku Klichaslan asks, um, okay, an industrial engineering student. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, working on the Syrian refugee problem. Okay, I will hope you will write to me. I would be curious to know what the project is. Um, but it's great that more engineering students or anyone from any field can study these important questions because we absolutely need everyone, um, every approach to answer this really complicated problem. Thank you.
Thank you. Congratulations again. And, you know, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for um, being with us and asking these wonderful questions. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.